is a great way to pivot to the world of medical cannabis. Um, before we dive into the panel, um, Sandra Caillo is a force of nature, um, probably more than that. Sandra, I'm just going to pull up her, her extensive um, resume. Uh, full disclosure, Sandra is on our advisory board at Regenibus. She is just uh, right from the early days, we felt that we needed to have some person with a medical background to be on our advisory board, and there didn't seem to be anybody out there who could fit the bill that we were looking for more than Sandra Carrillo. Sandra, so listen to this. Professor, Faculty of Medicine, University of, of Panama, head scientific medical cannabis program, co-founder, president, Colombian Medical Cannabis Association, co-founder, Medican Medical Cannabis Clinics in Colombia, Fido Medicines International Institute, head of Latin America, international speaker, and soon to be a speaker at the United Nations. And so let's please welcome Sandra Carrillo to the stage, and she's going to give us some great insights into why the world of medical cannabis is the path forward. Uh, hello, everybody. I am very happy to be here. This is an honor, and I really appreciate uh, that all of you are staying until this time. I know it's been a, a long day, um, and it's, it's about to end soon. Uh, of course, we leave the medical part at the end, because I think it's the more exciting of that. I want to thank Geoff and Patrick for uh, inviting me. I feel honored to be uh, at this place and at this time. I think uh, you have to be at the right place at the right moment, and, and this is exactly what I'm doing right now. Uh, re regarding to what I want to talk about that, as a physician, I really like the, the title of my lecture is uh, Reframing the Future of Medicine driving a new frontier for a healthier society. This is why I am a doctor, and this is why I use medical cannabis for my patients. I'm going to tell you a little story. I, I was born in Colombia, and I, uh, I was through all the dark ages of the war on drugs. So for me, the word marijuana or cannabis was a forbidden word. And when I was uh, practicing as an ER doctor, I never thought that I was going to use cannabis as medicine. Uh, even when I was hearing about that word, I was just like, oh my God, who's doing it? That's horrible. And, and then I wouldn't say that I was a traditional doctor or that I was a conservative doctor because I don't see any conservative uh, in giving patients lots of amounts of morphine or, or, or Percocet or benzodiazepines. I don't see any conservative in, in that. And uh, that I was a traditional, uh, talking about traditional, uh, let's talk uh, the medicine, the traditional medicine for thousands of years was based on plants. So uh, it's very important that we um, acknowledge that we've been using uh, plants as medicines and Mother Nature is always giving us what we need. And, and we have an endocannabinoid system for a reason because there is a plant that Mother Nature is giving us to help us heal. So this is a concept that is very important that I didn't understand. And sadly, a lot of doctors still don't understand. So for me, right now, we are in a very important moment. There is education. Uh, education is the key for destigmatizing the use of cannabis. This is the most important thing I've been uh, talking and I call it preaching because every time that I have an opportunity in a birthday party, no matter where I am, I talk about medical cannabis. Uh, I thought, and, so, and some people said to me, aren't you embarrassed about being talking about this? I, I live in, in, in Panama and it's still a conservative society and I said, why? I'm talking about health. I'm talking about uh, quality of life. Why should I be embarrassed about this? 
So this is a, a very important for me. And also, when you talk uh, about the, the objectives, about reframing the future of medicine, I see cannabis as a tool, as an alternative to reframe the future of medicine. I actually have been practicing and I had my clinical practice in Colombia. And since I started giving my patients medical cannabis, I have seen them improving their quality of life. And this is a very big word because it's not the same when you give a patient with cancer chemotherapy, you're helping that patient, but where is the quality of life? It's horrible. The patient is throwing up, it is not leaping, cannot eat, uh, has anxiety. Medical cannabis can give to that patient quality of life because helping to sleep better, reduce anxiety, to eat better, and also uh, helps with the nausea and vomiting induced by chemotherapy. And I can give you thousands of examples where medical cannabis is extremely useful. So as a doctor, and I did my uh, uh, oath as a doctor, and my main goal, and our main goal as doctors is primum non nocere, do not harm. As, as a doctors, we have the obligation to treat our patients based on scientific medicine. And this is the problem that we've been facing as, doctor, as doctors with medical cannabis, that there is a lot of doctors saying, oh, there is not enough scientific evidence, there is not proof. And when I, when I lecture for doctors and when I lecture for scientists, I show that there is scientific evidence. Uh, it's important to know when I was talking about plant medicine and traditional medicine, we see in this uh, graphic that cannabis is being used even 2,700 years before Christ. It was used in Chinese medicine and even a very famous uh, doctor that wrote a very famous medicine book that it was Avicenna included in his Treaty of Avicenna, that is a very ancient book, the qualities of medical cannabis for treating different pathologies. So we see in here, and then the Irish doctor William O'Shaughnessy brought the medical cannabis or the cannabis as a treatment for many pathologies. Unfortunately, something happened in 1937, and you don't need to know or I think you already know, I'm not gonna stop in there. But the beautiful news is even though the prohibition, uh, doctors and scientists all over the world, they fell in love of this plant and they didn't care about the prohibition and they studied the molecules, they studied the receptors. We have Professor Raphael Meshulam, we have Alin Howlett and William Devane, and we have hundreds of scientists all over the world that I keep studying this molecule because we know there is a lot of promise in here. Talking about scientific evidence, when they say there is no scientific evidence, I, I have so many resources to show that there is scientific evidence. This is one, uh, this is a publication that was done in 2017 uh, by the Ameri uh, National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine, and it's a very comprehensive review of more than 20,000 papers talking about the health effects of cannabis and cannabinoids uh, in the health. So in here, uh, uh, a group of uh, professionals, they did a very thoroughly revision of the literature about medical cannabis. And by the way, fun fact, when you Google cannabis of medical cannabis, you find more things than when you Google Tylenol. So it is it's so impressive how uh, we are facing, and we've been having this plant for so many years, and we've been neglecting uh, the plant. And I like to say uh, uh, what uh, um, Steve DeAngelo says that uh, uh, we are all part of the same tribe. All of us, industry, regulators, doctors, scientists, we need to be in the same page. Why? Because if uh, the industry thrives, we, as a doctors, we will have 
quality products. We will be able to give our patients good products that are going to help them to improve their health. We're going to be able to test those products. And uh, they were talking earlier about uh, labeling. This is very important because one of the things that is harming more the industry or the doctors, the practice cannabinoid therapies is the mislabeling because uh, a lot of patients, they just go and buy uh, uh, in the gas station or uh, in, in the streets products that are mislabeled and they actually do false claims and this is what really hurts the medicine that we're practicing. So it's very important that the industry, the regulators, the doctors, the scientists, we are all in the same page and we don't do false claims because we have scientific evidence uh, for treating uh, pathologies or symptoms uh, but they are particular uh, pathologies right now. We have publications in the most important uh, um, scientific uh, uh, magazines in the world talking about medical cannabis. In this uh, revision that they did in uh, 2017, they found that there is a strong evidence, uh, a conclusive evidence that medical cannabis works for uh, patients with chronic pain uh, as an anti-emetic or anti-nausea and vomiting for patients with nausea and vomiting induced by chemotherapy, and for patients uh, with uh, multiple sclerosis that have spasticity. After 2017, a lot of research is being released, and it's amazing because I wake up every day at 4 a.m. because there is so much to read. There is so many papers that are being released and published that this is so updated right now when we see how much evidence is being released regarding to insomnia, to sleep disturbances, to fibromyalgia, to PTSD, to uh, uh, neurodegenerative diseases. This is 2017 and 2022, everything changed. I, I am a co-creator of diploma certifications in alliance with universities, and I created two years ago a diploma certification, 120, 120 hours of, of content. We trained more than 200 doctors, and two years ago, uh, all the concepts that I put in there, they were valid back then, but right now we have to update because this is a very dynamic field of the medicine. We have to be on top every day. I have to read something because and I have that need and, and it's, it's, it's also a, an obligation with my patients to be updated and knowing what happened, what, what is new because new research is coming. Uh, you see in here in this slide how uh, uh, we have publications in Nature, New England Journals of Medicine, JAMA, uh, all the most important frontiers of neurology. We have uh, all the other publications. Health Canada even had their own publication about the important applications of cannabinoids and, and also Europe uh, he, uh, had a, a document very complete where they did a review of what pathologies are uh, um, uh, important to treat with cannabinoids, Journal on pa of Pain. And we see uh, uh, now I'm seeing the societies of medicine, society of psychiatrists. Uh, they call me because they have the uh, National Congress of Psychiatry, but they want to have uh, one module of medical cannabis because this is part as doctors we need to be updated in what is happening and in psychiatry part of whatever is coming in the world of the psychiatrist medical cannabis takes part so we go and we talk about what are the applications in mental health same thing anesthesiology or pain management they have the big conference and they call us doctors to talk about medical cannabis. They have also neurologists. They call doctors to talk about medical cannabis. And it's even funny, and it's a story that I was talking, uh, telling to a fellow. I am invited this year uh, in um, December uh, to talk 
uh, at the American Academy of Aesthetic Medicine about the applications of cannabinoids in aesthetic medicine, which they are important because we know the CBD is very good and, and CBG. And I was even consulted by a Hollywood celebrity recently because she wants to develop a um, skincare line. So we talk about, and I want to quote my good friend, uh, uh, Dr. Uma, the plant of cannabis is the plant of the five Ps. Uh, for the people, for the planet, for the pets, for profit, and for peace. So it's very important this, and I always quote her because this plant, and as uh, many of you are, are telling us, and as uh, Steve was mentioning in, in, the, in the video that he uh, recorded, it's a plant that is giving us food, uh, it's giving us clothing, it's giving us medicine. So definitely, uh, it's important to acknowledge that we need to do more research. But as doctors, we have our hands tied because it's very hard to do research on medical cannabis. And we will be talking later with Dr. Stacy Gruber here that is a, a, a pioneer in research. Uh, regulations are killing us because uh, they need to free the plant. Uh, if we want to really help the patients, we need to be able to do more research. There is applications that we already have a lot of uh, scientific evidence. Uh, scientific evidence that scientists and doctors consider good randomized controlled trials. Those are the gold standard and systematic reviews. We have a lot of the, of the ones that I showed you in the past about refractory epilepsy, multiple sclerosis, nausea and vomiting induced by chemotherapy, chronic pain, but this plant is so complex and it's so complete and it has so many compounds that we need to unleash the power of this plant, but we need to be able to research. Uh, without that, we are going to be just with the same four or five application, and it's sad because it's going to be just there. So I always encourage the regulators, the governments, the industry to fund research. I know it's very expensive, but we have scientists in here that are willing to put their work, and usually it's not a work that is well paid because it takes a lot of time to produce a randomized controlled trial or an observational study, but there is people willing to do it, so we need uh, um, this help. I am part right now of this uh, Global Health Catalyst Initiative. Uh, this is a, a, an initiative that it was born at Harvard University, uh, di uh, directed by Dr. Will Ngwa. Uh, the idea of this initiative is eliminate disparities and give the opportunities to countries that they don't have the resources to do research and education to be able to have access to this. And through this Health Catalyst Initiative, it was created the International Phytomedicines Institute. This institute, what it's going to do is to promote research. And it's very important because as I was telling you, without research, medical cannabis cannot keep moving forward. And as I said, we need to unleash all the potential the plant has. Right now, uh, we have the scientists, the doctors, we have our hands tied, so, so we need really uh, produce more uh, randomized controlled trials, but we cannot dismiss uh, in our clinical practice what we see every day uh, that is called real world evidence. It doesn't count as a randomized controlled trial, but if you see a thousand, so a thousand patients that you're giving them a combination of CBD, CBG, and CBDA, and it's improving in the pathology, uh, I, I, the, the numbers are speaking by themselves. So uh, we cannot dismiss this, and, and that's why I am very excited about this collaboration. Um, in 2019, uh, and a lot of cool things are happening in the area of cannabis. Uh, 2019, and I think Douglas Gordon uh, is over here, I don't know. Uh, Dr. Will, uh, he did preclinical studies at Harvard um, using a cannabis derivative. Um, 
uh, for treating pancreatic cancer. And the outcome was incredible, and he was using nano drone technology, so they were loading these uh, nano drones, micro drones, with this uh, the compound derivative of cannabis, a flavonoid, directing it to the tumor in mice, preclinical studies, and they found the reduction of the tumor, the reduction of metastasis, and, and then we see that the sky is the limit. What we need right now is the, 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 the governments and the regulators and the funding that is something so important. And is this what it really gives me hope and excites me and, and it, it keeps me going because I see now Ivy Leagues like Harvard Medical School, Oxford, uh, you see in here John Hopkins, uh, different uh, stakeholders betting on research. Uh, we are about to start a multicentric clinical trial uh, about uh, uh, the potential of these uh, uh, flavonoid derivatives from the cannabis plant for treating medical cannabis. So it's, this is going to be a large uh, multicentric study with uh, centers in Latin America, in Europe, in the United States, uh, hopefully Malta, and different countries. So in here, we are uh, uh, with this International Institute of Phytomedicines we try to eliminate disparities and help those countries that don't have the resources to do research, to have funding to do the, the research. Uh, so it's very important for all of us uh, to understand that we need to do this together. As a doctor, I have no doubt that cannabis is medicine. I've been teaching and lecturing in more than 20 countries. I travel all over the world, and I've been talking to, talking to doctors that are very skeptic, and I love when I walk into a room of doctors, 70 years old, they've been practicing all their lives, and they're going in there just because it's like an obligation. And then when you talk about the endocannabinoid system, how it works, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics. Uh, they, you show them the scientific evidence, the randomized control trials. You see the switch. Uh, uh, they change the mentality. And I always say to doctors, I don't pretend that after my lecture, you just run to prescribe medical cannabis. But as a doctor, you have the obligation with your patient to know what is medical cannabis, what is good for, because the patients are coming to our consultations asking us for medical cannabis. It's very rare uh, before when I was practicing the other medicine, because I wouldn't call it traditional or conservative, it was other type of medicine. Patients were coming like, never come to say, oh, I need an anti-hypertensive, oh, I need an antibiotic. No, it was the doctor, the one who saw the patient and, and decided. Now I have the patient to, to, to come to my consultation because they want medical cannabis. So education is so important because, of course, there, there is not for everybody, and we have to be uh, uh, try to be very um, assertive and, and to tell the truth to the patients and not create, don't create false expectatives. But I see so much research being done uh, in Israel. I was talking to Daddy Mary that has been working with different tumoral cells, and now he told me they're about to start uh, clinical trials uh, in breast cancer. So this is a legacy that we're going to leave to our children when we find a plant. They have all these compounds that can make a difference in the health of the patient, and it's not just the improvement of the quality of life of the patients, what I see, is the improvement of the quality of the life of the family, of the surrounding. Every and each of one of you here have or will have a patient, a family member, a friend that one day is going to need to use uh, cannabis, medical cannabis, so we need to keep making this uh, a better medicine, which is a good medicine, but it, it could be better because we, we, we can have uh, uh, more studies. I just have these pictures in here because I love advocacy, so uh, in one picture I'm with the President of Colombia signing uh, one of the decrees allowing the regulation to go uh, more um, 
uh, re, uh, b uh, easier for the producers to be able to export flour. Uh, also, oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, this is the one that I was telling you about. The, I, I, thought, I thought I was showing you. This is the multicentric study that I was uh, that I was talking about. The, all the uh, um, universities that are collaborating with the Phytomedicine International Institute about the multicentric study. So you see in here even governments from different countries. As I said, soon Malta will be also in the in this in this slide, but we see uh, Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, Harvard Medical School, Oxford, Pennsylvania University, John Hopkins. So we see that these universities are seeing the potential the medical cannabis or the cannabis plant has, and they want to study it properly. I, I do think that it's very hard to conduct randomized clinical trials with a plant that has more than a thousand compounds, but I think the scientists are, are, are doing their best and they're figuring out how to isolate some co compounds and then bring them together because I do believe that the full uh, uh, plant, the whole plant is, is the best medicine, but for purposes of research, it's important that they uh, start uh, studying one by one. It's complicated, but I know that with everybody's effort, we, we, can, we can make it, and this is an example. In here, as I said, I was part of the legalization of medical cannabis in Panama. That is the, on, the, on my left, the president of the National Assembly when we legalized in Panama. Of course, with Professor Rafael Meshulam uh, in Israel at his office. He's a wonderful guy. I sat with him a whole morning and he was talking to me like he has nothing else to do. He was answering the phone from all over the world and talking. So we are blessed and I feel blessed uh, that there is doctors, that they are willing to give and share knowledge because that knowledge is so important for the future generations that I, uh, I think we need to make the education about cannabinoid therapies more accessible for uh, everybody, for doctors, for nurses, for all the all the uh, scientific communities because through education we're going to achieve the goal that we have is to heal uh, as uh, uh, my friend Dr. Uma says, heal the planet because it's a plant that gives us a lot of benefits. So in here, of course, we have a lot of challenges, but I see industry united, scientists united, uh, patients united, advocates united. So I think we can make it. Um, it's been a long road and it's still a long road to go, but uh, we're gonna leave a legacy to our children and a better world if we, if we keep doing what we're doing. Uh, and we do it with love and with the passion uh, and the motivation of, of helping others. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the attention. That's an incredible body of work. Um, well done, really, really cool. Uh, don't go too far because um Sandra, you're going to moderate.